It's day three of GT7 1.31. They'll be suspecting that I'm covering the Porsche 904 Carrera GTS, but no, that would be too easy. <laughs> <laughs> because what we're actually talking about is a big old box with a steering wheel, is the Toyota Alphard, a vehicle which of course was in the leaked data mining list, probably one of the standouts along with stuff like the Renault Aventine because it was so weird to see in there, and yet now that we have it, it's one hell of a machine. I mean, spoiler alert, you're going to see just how quick this thing can be, even with a basic tune that I slapped on it. You can tune it up to the mid-500 horsepower region, I believe 540, 560, something like that off the top of my head. You can drop the weight a whole lot. Thankfully, given that it is over 2.2 tons stock, you can, however, drop that to more like the 1600 kilo region. So what is the deal with this thing? Like, why would they add this to the game? And now that it's here, what can it actually do? Well, the reason why they would add it, of course, you'd have to ask Katz. Maybe he was a passenger in one at some point. Maybe he really liked it. Maybe he even drove one. Maybe he just added it for some kind of cultural reason. You can speculate all day long, but I actually love the fact that this is in the game. It seems to be a bit of a controversial car so far with many people saying that they have found it much better than they thought it was going to be. I definitely fall into that camp. And then there are some other people who are just saying, why would you add something this stupid? I'd rather have this, I'd rather have that. Let's be honest, those kind of people say that about literally anything. They probably say that about the touring car, they probably say that about the Porsche 959 as well, because if there's one thing you know about the Gran Turismo community, or even the Forza community, or any community really, is whenever you give them something for free especially, they always just say what they wanted instead. As I've said before in the past, the best way to make someone ungrateful for something is to give it to them for free. So in the case of this car, I like it in particular before I'd even driven it because it's more of a throwback. It feels like the Honda Odysseys, the Honda Elements, the Renault Aventimes, even something like the Renault Espas F1, which of course is my favourite car of the entire franchise. These just really weird, strange, oddball, unexpected choices which 9 times out of 10 turn out to be a lot better than you'd think. The Honda Odyssey being a prime example, it's actually a pretty damn quick minivan in, for example, Gran Turismo 6. And likewise with this one, spoiler alert, this thing is really good. Now of course it shares its engine with a car that's already in the game, bonus point down in the comments if you already know which one that is. You're looking at just under 300 horses stock, as I said you can tune it to well over 500. Fingers crossed so hard it looks like a barber's sign that this gets a better engine swap in future because imagine this thing with like a, a Shelby GT350 engine or a, a Scudo engine <laughs> maybe, because with what this can do with 500 horsepower, imagine what it could do with a thousand. This kind of would be an unironic spiritual successor to the Renault, as crazy as that sounds, because it is so rapid. Now there are two things about this vehicle which I would say are not as good. At least, well, one of them standard, and one of them is a more permanent thing. The more permanent thing, as many have said, is the chase cam, for those of us who like to use it, is pretty restrictive. It's a very big car, the chase cam needs to be much further away, and in particular, not even just further away, it needs to just be higher up. So that's a, an annoying thing there. It's nothing new in Gran Turismo to have cars with bad visibility. I mean, even the Suzuki Escudo was a prime example with a huge wing. It used to be awful in the older games to see past the car. The other thing, at least in stock form, and I mentioned this in my review for the whole update, was that it, it felt almost like the Subaru Vision GT, the Visiv, wherein it's got way too much torque and power going to the front axle instead of the rear, which means that when you try and gun it out of a corner, it feels more like a front-wheel drive car. And in the case of something this big, and in particular this heavy, you really don't want that kind of torque steer and understeer sending you out toward the wall. You want it to be able to turn in when you need it to and really make full use of that all-wheel drive. Thankfully, as I alluded to back then before I tuned it, and certainly now that I have, and I think you can pretty clearly see it in this video from the speeds that I'm taking corners at, with a bit of diff tuning, and in particular center diff tuning especially, you can completely remove that problem. This is a genuine weapon when tuned correctly, and it's always been one of my favorite things in literally any racing game that has larger vehicles to use them, because people just don't expect a bigger car to be as quick and as capable as they can be. Another huge advantage that you have with larger, heavier vehicles, and this even goes for muscle cars, it's one of my favorite reasons for using them as well, is because they're big, heavy, and quote-unquote slower to begin with, 
such as, for example, this vehicle sitting at only 395 points, or a fraction under, which is nothing on the point scale, certainly not for a 300 horsepower vehicle, it means that you have so much wiggle room for tuning. You can get loads of power out of it for its particular point level, and even have yourself a devastatingly effective car in some cases, which you just wouldn't expect. Another perfect example of this kind of sleeper, one of the best examples, I would say, as recently as Gran Turismo 6, was the Infinity FX45 concept. The SUV is this big, round, soft-looking concept SUV, which of course ended up as a road car, and it is genuinely so quick and so good in Gran Turismo 6, even though it's not even the most powerful of SUVs. This reminds me of that kind of vibe. I may do a tune setup for it, possibly even the one that I'm using here, because it's so much fun when you tune it correctly, you can genuinely make this thing feel like what you'd expect a Ford Supervan to feel like. Maybe even the newer Supervan, or, or that Drift Hyundai van that they built as well that I talked about years ago on the channel. Now the price tag on this one is not that much, 75000 For many people, you could justifiably say, I guess, that it's not a quote-unquote essential purchase, but I will say, you might need to do yourself a favour and pick up one of these anyway, because you might find yourself liking it a lot more than you'd think. You have some interesting visual tuning that you can do, as you can see here, and it's just so devastatingly quick, especially if you don't fit racing tyres, because with any vehicle, obviously, the tyres jump the points way up immediately. So if you don't do that, keep it on comforts or especially sports tyres, you really could have yourself an absolute weapon for say the 550 point level, maybe even the 600 point level if you're going up against AI, but yeah, top end speed of course is not going to blow everything out of the water because it's very unaerodynamic compared to most sports cars in the game, but up around 170, 180 is more than good enough for tighter circuits. I hadn't optimized the gears by any means, as you can tell they're a little bit too long in this race, it takes too long to get up into sixth. But even then, if that's what it can already do like that, well imagine what it could do if you were to really spend loads and loads of time optimizing a car like this. I'm certainly going to optimize mine even more to make it even more fun. As I said, I may well do a tune for it on the channel, because it's just so much fun to drive. So ultimately, that's kind of it for my thoughts. I really think that you should not discount this vehicle. So many people just write off cars like this, the Renault Aventine, plenty of others, and they just think, oh, that's stupid. Why would you add it in the game, I want race cars, I want supercars, I want this, I want that. Forget that for a second, because regardless of what you want, this is what you've got. So you can either choose to not use what you've got and potentially miss out on the hopes of something maybe coming in the future, or still hope for it in the future, but enjoy what you've got now as well. That's the camp that I prefer to be in, because if, in the case of cars like this, or the Mazda 3, which we'll talk about in the next couple of days, if you do give them a chance, you will more often than not be surprised by how good they can be. And I will definitely say that doing beards and cars on the channel, the real world car reviews, that definitely ties into why I recommend trying out these weird choices so much. Because most of the time in that series, the cars that I enjoy reviewing and driving the most, sometimes even ones that I end up buying myself, are almost never the ones that I expect to love as much as I do. So give it a try if you haven't already. Go out on a limb. I mean, there's literally nothing to lose. It's barely any credits to even buy it. And of course, if you have already tried it and love the car, tell me down below if you've tried it and maybe still don't like it. Well, perhaps try out the tune setup that I'm going to be doing in the next few days. Like I said, give it another try and see if it changes your mind. But ultimately, that's it for my thoughts on the Alphard. Very interesting machine, not too many natural rivals at the moment, but we'll have to wait and see in future. And of course, stick around for the next couple of days to feature the last two vehicles, the aforementioned Mazda, and of course tomorrow, the Porsche 904. But that's it for this review, of course, I'll see you next time, and for now, as always, thanks for watching.